The Islamic Circle of North America presents a Psalm Vision production, Choosing Islam. During the course of this program, we'll introduce you to people of diverse backgrounds. In Quranic terms, each of them can be described as having been people of the book. Formerly Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Jewish, even Jehovah's Witness, each of them has made the choice to merge their lives into the path that is Islam. Rafael Nabayez is a former Jehovah's Witness pastor. In an address entitled My Way to Islam, he describes the circumstances leading to his decision to become Muslim. I have to speak to my brothers and sisters and talk to you about Islam from an American perspective, an American born in America, not Muslim, without Muslim parents. So sometimes I feel like I am not worthy and I don't deserve certainly to be in the same category as some of the fine brothers that I've had an opportunity to listen to this morning and this afternoon and certainly uh, later on today and throughout the convention. But I've learned one thing about Islam and that is that you do not argue with God. So I'll take whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses me with and I hope to do the best that I can. I. Uh, I have a very uh, kind of unique background in a way. I, to kind of recap a little bit about uh, my experiences, I'm originally from Texas, small West Texas town called Lubbock. And it's right in the center of the Bible Belt, kind of, very religious, lots of, lots of churches in the city. Being Hispanic, I speak uh, Spanish fluently, I was, uh, of course, baptized as a Catholic. I was raised as a Catholic, baptized as a Catholic, until the age of about six years old. When I turned six years old, my parents received a knock on the door, and there were some people standing there with the watchtower and the awake. And they started to speak with my grandfather, and after a while, he, they started to come back. Before long, they established a Bible, a home Bible study, and uh, before you knew it, we were all attending the, the Church of Jehovah's Witness. We were all attending the, the meetings in the congregation there. When I first accepted Islam, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Uh, I didn't realize that it entailed uh, many prayers five times a day. I didn't realize that I would need to fast the month of Ramadan. Uh, I was basically naive and ignorant. Uh, at the same time, I really didn't care what I had to do because I wanted to become like the people that I had met. Um, I wanted the generosity, the humility, um, the uh, charisma. Mohammed Eckhaus is an acupuncturist in Panama City, Florida. I grew up in a Jewish family on Long Island, New York, uh, in suburbia, middle class. Uh, my family was Jewish, uh, more Zionistically oriented than actually Jewish by faith. Uh, I grew up in a vacuum, basically. I grew up without um, any religious teachings, instruction, um, foundation. And as a result of that, by the time I reached my late teens, I um, felt like I wanted something more out of life than just pursuing a materialistic lifestyle, uh, more than just attempting to uh, purchase a two-car garage and television sets and so on and so forth. As a result of that, when I went to university, I uh, stumbled into relationships with various uh, philosophers, uh, teachers of religion. Um, I spent time with uh, Tibetan lamas, uh, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ members, Jewish rabbis, uh, about the only form of religion that I didn't encounter until uh, I was working towards a PhD at New York University in the middle 70s was Islam. Quiz program. Yusuf Islam was raised Greek Orthodox. In 1977, his brother David gave him a Quran after visiting a mosque in Jerusalem. Yusuf gave up a multi-million dollar career in music to devote his time to pleasing Allah. In addition to operating a full-time school in the UK for Muslim children, he is frequently invited to speak about his acceptance of Islam. Some brothers, they keep on saying to me, why don't you make music and 
so the kids can learn, you know, Islamic songs. So I have a basic philosophy about that. I believe if someone wants to find out about Islam, it's not going to be necessarily through a song, even though there may be. Sometimes you come into contact with cultural uh, aspects of Islam, you may be attracted. But ultimately, there's a big question mark over the person who leaves Jahiliya and goes to Islam. What is it about Islam that is so valuable that what we have wasn't interesting for this man anymore. So it's also a game of psychology. That if you want to know about Islam, don't think I'm going to stand up on stage and sing you a song about it. Islam, it seems to me, is too pure to be mixed with other cultures. It can lead. Others can imitate, but it cannot imitate. Therefore, there needs to be careful thought and consideration on how we are going to present Islam. We should realize, looking at the nature of the human being, the Prophet ﷺ said, every child is born with pure nature original Adamic nature. It is only his parents who make him Christian or a Jew or a fire worshipper. That is very important. The response of individuals like these is typical of the impact Islam is having on Western society. Indeed, statistics show that Islam is the fastest growing faith in the United States. But if Americans are finding peace and contentment in Islam, why is so much negativity associated with it in various media? Dr. Thomas Ballantyne Irving is an author, historian, and university professor. During years of study in the Middle East, he translated several works of Islamic literature into English and Spanish. He traces present-day antagonisms to the Crusades. First of all, it comes from the Crusades. I mean, there's a great deal of folklore in the crusade, uh, from the Crusades, which has been in the group since the 12th century. So that's about 800 years. And I don't say that it can be disappear overnight, but it exists. Then the other thing is that most of the university, um, the high level communication is done by mostly British and French Orientalists, some Germans, who uh, they have learned this crusading idea, but at a higher level. And with France, of course, it's with their invasion of Algeria and Syria. And with England, it's Egypt and India. And this has created a whole series of, of um, opinions, which are in French and, Spa and English literature. The Americans have picked it up, I would say, largely through the missionaries at the beginning, especially the missionaries who went out to the uh, Turkish Empire in the last century, to Lebanon, to Egypt, a few to Morocco. And this is colored American opinion. But the idea is that it's a distant object. I call it, this is the antiseptic approach. They always say, oh, there is Islam way over there. I'm going to tell you about it, but don't go near it because it's dangerous as if it's some sort of disease. At Chicago's DePaul University, Dr. Amanat McLeod is an assistant professor in the Religious Studies Department. She agrees that the phenomenon of Muslim bashing is largely a byproduct of Christian hostility. The, the antagonism between the West and Islam, the West and the Orient, Christianity and Islam, uh, is an old kind of hostility that has been around for a while. It's been nurtured and propagated in various sorts of ways depending upon the era. It predates Western and is fundamentally Christian antagonism uh, toward Islam that looks and, and, and seeks out aberrant 
according to its own norms, things. It does not hold its own uh, norms up for scrutiny. As a matter of fact, in Cedar Rapids, this is where I happen to be, a girl came over just when the, the Persian Gulf crisis broke, a, a reporter from the, um, one of the local television stations, and it was very interesting to watch it. She came over to get, on a Friday, to get information about Islam. And I remember one of the Indian Muslims in the congregation said to her, I hope you don't call us Muslim. And she said, it's in the dictionary, and just kind of like that, sharp. That isn't an authority if it's wrong. Well, the point is that most dictionaries give M-O-S-L-E-M, but when you spell it that way, you don't say the S is an S, you say it as a Z. And Muslim and Zulam is not peace. It's injustice or evil. And when they call us Muslims, they're insulting us. There are insults ongoing that are reserved for difference that cannot be located in exotic. Okay? And especially if you're an American. If you're a Hindu and you come with a spot on your head and your belly out and you, you know, but you still have on a sari and all of these things, because there is a category called exotic, you're acceptable. But for American Muslim women, because they typically are covering themselves American style, there's always a problem. If you've grown up in the West, you've been exposed to anti-Islamic programming from an early age. Even the entertainment designed for children has been infused with not-so-subtle messages. In Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, Olive Oil and all viewers watching are taught the role of women in Muslim society. Indeed, Muslims and the Islamic way of life have been the brunt of jokes since the beginning of Hollywood. Behold, we said to the angels, bow down unto Adam. They bowed down, except Iblis. He said, shall I bow down to one whom you created from clay? He said, is this the one whom you have honored above me? If you will give me time until the day of judgment, I will surely bring his descendants under my sway, all save a few. Allah said, go your way. If any of them follow you, truly, hell will be the compensation of you all, an ample compensation. Lead to destruction those whom you can among them with your seductive voice. Make assaults on them with your cavalry and your infantry. Mutually share with them wealth and children and make promises to them. But Satan promises them nothing but deceit. The evil one made a promise, and he and his confederates work overtime to keep it. Well, the whole family started to go as a Jehovah's Witness. Before long, I started gaining a very accurate knowledge of the Bible, which is kind of an irony because anyone that's familiar with the scriptures knows uh, of the, the book of the people, knows that, um, that in reality has been polluted so much throughout history. It has been contaminated and polluted so much. But, you know, I've always been of the kind that have felt that in its pure form, even with the Jews, the Torah was given to them. In its pure form, until it was moved around and polluted, it was from God. The Injil, the same thing. The Gospel, when it was given to, uh, to Jesus at the beginning, before the pollution, before the contamination, was good and sound. Well, my knowledge of the Bible started to grow. I began to study more and more. By the time I was 13 years of age, I was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. And I had this fire, this ambition inside of me to want to do more of God's work. So by the time I applied myself, I applied myself. And then by the time I was 16 years of age, it was something very unusual that wasn't done. I began, I was approved 
and given their blessing, and I started to speak to great crowds, big crowds of people. I started to give talks in their different uh, congregations. By the time I was 20 years of age, I had my own congregation that I had to pastor or take care of. So as you can see, I was very much entrenched into the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses, especially knowing that they were different from the world. But see, the world looked at them anytime, especially Western society, anytime you're different, they look at them as extremists, fanatics, fundamentalists. Sounds familiar, huh? I realize now that it was all in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's planning for me. I, I, I didn't know it at that time. But what I wasn't aware then that I am aware of now is that when I was 120 days in the womb of my mother, the angels came and they had already planned where I was going to be, what I was going to do, and that I was going to be here on this day speaking to you, alhamdulillah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن تتقوا الله يجعل O oh, you who believe, if you fear Allah, He will grant you a criterion to judge between right and wrong, remove from you all evil that may afflict you, and forgive you. For Allah is the Lord of grace, unbounded. وإذ يمكر بك الذين كفروا ليثبتوك أو يقتلوك أو Remember how the unbelievers plotted against you to keep you in bonds or slay you or get you out of your home. They plot and plan, and Allah too plans. But the best of planners is Allah. It's all thanks to uh, Salman Rushdie. Omar Abdurrahman, a fourth year law student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, read the satanic verses in 1989. Here, he describes his reaction. Well, all thanks is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, it's the reaction to Salman Rushdie. But the satanic verses, because of the controversy, I became uh, interested in studying Islam. I had examined other religions prior to that, uh, but I had never considered Islam. Uh, but when I read uh, the satanic verses, I felt as a sort of an intellectual fairness uh, that I should also understand Islam in order to get to the other side. And in the process of studying it from an intellectual viewpoint, I actually became involved in it from an emotional and spiritual viewpoint. And alhamdulillah, I accepted it. We have the most beautiful book that God has ever produced for the salvation of mankind, for them to live in peace and tranquility, the Quran. We need to read it ourselves and find out for ourselves what is the acceptable word of God and what is our purpose on this earth. In Islam, there is no hierarchy. Uh, there is no priesthood. Um, there is no intermediary between man and God. Allah, or God, refers to himself. He says, call me Allah or call me Rahman. Rahman, the Arabic word, mean, means the merciful. Throughout the Quran, uh, Allah is, God is always presented as forgiving. Uh, we as Muslims are told that each time we do ablutions before each prayer, we are removing all of our wrong actions. Islam is a, a, a very merciful religion, and technically it's the same as Judaism and Christianity. One Christian came to me in one of my classes and asked me why I do not worship Jesus. And I said to him, if I was going to worship a man, I would worship Adam, because he had neither father nor mother. <laughs> and he is recognized as a man, as Jesus was. So why do you not worship Adam? We as Muslims uh, revere Jesus as uh, a Muslim. A Muslim means, in English, the word Muslim means one who submits to God. Islam means submission to God. What did Jesus do other than that? Inevitably, there comes a time in life when one begins to question the nature of existence. As children, we wanted to know how we got here. As parents, we placate our children with answers like, from mom's tummy, or the stork brought you. Sooner or later, most humans concede the existence of a greater authority. After all, we didn't create ourselves. 
The Quran states of the creator of all that exists, Lahul Asma Ul Husna. To him belong the most beautiful names. He is the sovereign, the holy one, the source of peace, the guardian of faith, the preserver of safety, the exalted in might, the irresistible, the supreme, the creator, the evolver, the bestower of forms. And of all the names or attributes used to describe his magnificence, Allah is used most frequently in his revelation. So Muslims refer to their maker in the manner he has taught them. Knowledge is the inheritance which we gain from the prophets. This is the inheritance for the believers. The Prophet ﷺ said that you must seek knowledge. It is obligatory on every Muslim to seek knowledge. What is that knowledge though? Some may use that to justify their taking degrees and degrees and going and going through university, etc., and collecting their degrees, saying, well, the Prophet ﷺ said, seek knowledge, it's obligatory. But what knowledge? This is the question. So the knowledge which the Prophet meant, according to Imam Ghazali, is that knowledge which is obligatory on you. In other words, when you are born, the first thing that the parent teaches the child is la ilaha illallah. There's no God but Allah. The first duty, the human being must know his creator. He must know then his teacher, Muhammad Rasulullah. And all the prophets were teachers, and the last teacher was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last messenger. Then, when the child grows, of course he must learn how to clean himself. It becomes obligatory to know tahara, how to be clean. He'll get to the stage when he must learn how to pray. So that knowledge becomes obligatory at that time. Obligatory for that child, some say at the age of seven, to learn how to pray. Because the obligation of prayer will come at the age of 10, or the age of puberty. Knowledge of zakah. How many of us here have the knowledge of zakah? Yet it's obligatory the moment you have come to the age of responsibility, the moment you have wealth, obligatory now is that you know how to spend or how to distribute zakah. This is the obligatory knowledge because without this knowledge, your life has become worthless. It is the knowledge which will take you into the life to come and which will give you the success, the true success. The knowledge of fasting, you must know how to fast. What breaks the fast? What time must you break the fast? How many days is Ramadan? You must have that knowledge when you've come to the age where you must fast. Because this is a duty. Hajj. You must learn Hajj when you are able to go on Hajj. You don't have to learn Hajj now, for instance. But when you are able to go on Hajj, then you must learn the duties of Hajj. According to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islam is built on five pillars. The first, called Shahadatain, is to give witness that there is no deity other than Allah, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his servant and messenger. The second pillar of Islam is Salat, a routine of five daily prayers to be observed at specific times during the day. The third pillar is Zakat, an annual charity minimally calculated at 2.5% of one's accumulated wealth. 
Psalm, or fasting, is the fourth pillar of Islam, requiring one to forego food and worldly desires between dawn and sunset. The fast is observed once a year by able-bodied adult Muslims for 29 or 30 days during the holy month of Ramadan. The final pillar is Hajj, a journey or pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca in Arabia, commemorating the struggle and sacrifice of Prophet Abraham and his family. Hajj is incumbent on all able-bodied adults at least once in their lifetime, provided they can afford the journey. Each of the pillars has been known to demonstrate tremendous powers of transformation in the lives of people. In fact, it was the fifth pillar of Islam that had such a profound effect in the life of Malcolm X. He don't have to worry about us integrating with him. We don't want to be around that old tale thing. Malcolm X was known as a fiery speaker, as a spokesman for the nation of Islam. He had little trust and no affection for white people. He was accused by the press in the U.S. of being a black racist. When the Nation of Islam suspended him for commenting on the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963, a friend urged him to perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. Since I am a Muslim, and I knew that I could never stand up in public and represent Mr. Muhammad anymore, and at the same time I didn't at that time want to say why I couldn't represent him, I knew as his son told me, uh, Wallace Muhammad, that the only salvation for the Muslims, they would have to turn toward the orthodox religion of Islam. And it was Mr. Muhammad's son, Wallace Muhammad, who encouraged me to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and get myself orient oriented or orientated into the knowledge of the orthodox religion of Islam. Malcolm described his experience in Mecca with these words. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as it is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets of the holy scriptures. For the past week, I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed around me by people of all colors. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experience in America had led me to believe never could exist between the white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam because this is the only religion that erases from its society the race problem. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white. But the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together, irrespective of their color. You may be shocked by these words coming from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. This is a house formed. Eleven years later, Wallace Muhammad inherited the leadership of his father's organization. Never before had so many in America been led to embrace the proper teachings of Islam. My last year in college, I was doing an independent study on institutions, all forms of institutions. Aisha K. Mustafa is the editor of Mr. Muhammad's weekly newspaper, The Muslim Journal. My professor, a sociology professor, when I told him what I wanted to do my independent study on, pulled out a book called The Black Muslims by C. Eric Lincoln and asked me would I read this as a part of my independent study. And actually that was my first direct contact with quote unquote black Muslims as they existed here in the United States. I did not fully agree with the context of the organization, uh, primarily in the, in the sense of a representing man in the form of God uh, uh, of, of any color. That somehow did not quite strike a note of a chord with me. But the context of there being an organized, structured group who were willing to work towards improvement of the African-American community did strike with me, and that stayed with me. 
يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ O mankind, we have created you all out of one pair, a male and a female. We have made you into peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Noblest among you in the eyes of God is the most righteous. Islam is the upward path. If we study actually the word which gives us a clue about this, in Arabic the word for student is talib. Talib. It actually means someone who is seeking. Therefore, part of the transaction, which is education, is that there must be someone who is seeking. I was, I was looking for something fulfilling and something stable and something that I could structure my life by. A lot of people don't like structure, but I'm one who prefer a structured life. And in that search, I found that Al-Islam gives you structure, it gives you direction, it gives you content, and it, it gives you um, what I would like to refer to and what most Muslims refer to as a, as a greater reality. And of course, that reality includes your, the concept of God, uh, a clear, clean-cut concept of a supreme being, being over everything and over all creation. So after a lot of consideration in prayer and a lot of heartache, I left. 1979, I left the religion. And I, I didn't go back. Well, then what happened is I could no longer go to any other religion. Because as a Jehovah's Witness, I was taught that all religions were bad, except Jehovah's Witness. Only Jehovah's Witness gained the approval of God. Everybody else is wrong. So you see, with a clear conscience, I could not go to other religions. And then as a Jehovah's Witness, I no longer believed in their teachings. So I was like a man without a religion. Fortunately. I was not a man without a God. Everybody's faith is, of course, a personal thing. Everybody comes to it in different roles, on different avenues, or in different aspects of life. Um, you, you begin to recognize and compare and actually study. And for me, it, it was that kind of a process. It was a comparison, a studying, or, or, and then there was the recognition that this, in fact, is something that could be satisfying for me. And it was something that, um, an avenue that I hadn't taken before. I even went back to the Catholic Church. I said I was born a Catholic, and I've been a Jehovah's Witness all my life, so I'm going to go back to the Catholic Church. Maybe I missed something. Okay? So I went back to the Catholic Church for about three months, every day. Sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. You know, I go to all of their masses. It wasn't working. It wasn't working because it didn't appeal here, and it didn't appeal here. You try the church and you try everything else, but uh, there's still that void. And over the 17 years, I've been reaffirmed in this choice over and over again that this is indeed the better choice, the better alternative, and, uh, it, and it will lead to the successes that we were pursuing in life. About five years ago, I had the privilege and the honor of meeting a Muslim person. And I noticed that person because of their personality, always happy, always bubbly, always friendly. This attracted me to that person. So we started talking, the person told me uh, uh, that it was Muslim, she was Muslim, it was a lady, she was Muslim and everything and all of that. Really, I've heard of Muslim, I've heard of them. You have the religion Islam, no? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. I have no intentions of becoming Muslim. And I said, I'm going to learn how to be a Christian, a good Christian, not Jehovah's Witness way, but how God wants me to be a Christian. So I began to study the Bible very, very uh, closely at night and, and many hours and in prayer. I read all of the New Testament. I thought I had it all lined up. Then I started on the Old Testament, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Exodus. When I got to the prophets, something happened. When I got to reading in the Bible about the prophets, all of a sudden, I wanted to rest my eyes and I started thinking about that person that told me about Islam, about being a Muslim, about a Quran, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So I said, okay, I am open-minded now. I don't think like a Jehovah's Witness. I'm going to find out if these people are liars, if they are no good or whatever. I'm going to find out for myself. I started thinking 1.2 billion Muslims. Shaitan is good, but he's not that good. <laughs> to deceive 1.2 billion people. So I'll look at this, this Quran and I'll see what it is. I started reading the Quran. I read it completely all the way through the first time. It was unbelievable. Everything started to fall in place. Everything made sense. I took the Quran and now I could say to my Bible, I know now it all works together. Now I understand. Because of the Quran, I was able to understand my Bible. And I say, oh, this is great. God is making me a good Christian. He's going to teach me through the Quran. Well, as I kept reading and kept reading, I kept reading the Quran more because it made more sense, it was easier, it was simpler. It appealed more to my heart, to my intellect, to my mind. And my Bible, as much as I know that at one time it was a holy wo uh, word of God, now in its polluted state, I started to put it down more. And I started to read the Quran. O mankind, verily, there has come to you a convincing proof from your Lord, for we have sent unto you a light that is manifest. Education is the beginning of Islam. As we know, the first revelation which was sent to the Prophet ﷺ was that revelation which began Iqra, read. The order was to read. Uh, people are fascinated about Islam in America. They're worried about it, and they're confused about it, and they're afraid of it in some ways, but they're also enticed by it and intrigued by it. Abdul Hai Moore is a writer and editor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He was introduced to Islam while running a theater company in Berkeley, California. Uh, the intelligent reader, certainly. And, the, and there's an, uh, a deeper appreciation of, uh, of Islamic culture I think among people, and hopefully as time goes on and there are more uh, writers among the Muslim community who are, who would, who are willing to break out of, say, a mold of pure uh, religious tractism is what I'm calling it, just writing a tract about how great it is to be a Muslim and everyone should be a Muslim, you know, then, then things may happen. I think people will see that there's a sweetness and a, and a, uh, uh, a way of expressing uh, what's in our hearts uh, that everyone would be interested in. Uh, I, I think it's really important that um, uh, Muslims start uh, approaching the people as people, and that and that Islam uh, is happens to be our focus, and that it's the um, uh, and that there are in, uh, exciting, enticing, and beautiful things about it that people would be attracted to. I remember in in Santa Barbara. There was a man who was not a Muslim, but he was an intelligent man. He was a writer and a, and a book reviewer. And he, say, he came up to me once and he said, you know, you ought to tell the Protestants about Islam. They would like to know that, for example, uh, it wasn't Eve's fault. <laughs> you know, it wasn't her, that, <laughs> it, 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 that the women are not the ones who are the, the major uh, uh, sinners in, in, in the religion. And on and on, he went through a whole list of things that, that he thought the, the, the Protestants would be very excited to know about. That um, you know that would ch that that is in fact some of the basic teachings of our of Islam. Surely, with every difficulty, there is ease. With every difficulty, there is ease. Therefore, when you are free from your immediate task, still labor hard. And to your Lord, turn all of your attention. Jihad is an organizing principle in Islam because at every level and at every facet, of Islamic understanding is the notion of struggle. Struggle from within against both what is within and what is without. The initial testimony of faith upon which uh, 
Islamic understandings are built, known as the Shahada, where you state that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger, is an awesome state, very simple but very awesome. Because to be able to reflect on needs, wants, and desires and all the things um, around you and to still say that there is no God, meaning no ruling factor, no creating factor, no thing that controls except God, is awesome. Okay, To want to enter into the process of becoming Muslim and to move to submit your will is also awesome because you have to identify it. And most human beings, no matter where they are in the world, have no idea of what their will is and tend to um, identify it when its manifestations are dramatic in things like uh, the will of a people for nationalism, the will of uh, slaves for freedom, but they don't, in, <clears throat> they don't identify more fundamental aspects of will, which are things like forsaking something you want to do or desire to do for something else which may be pleasurable to God, the God you claim to serve. To, uh, to back off in an argument, you know, to know that th this is not pleasing God, let me back off. To, to give up uh, centers of ego, to uh, do those things which may or may not benefit self for the benefit of the community, which would be pleasing to God. Jihad is the organizing principle in that struggle. It's the organizing principle in the struggle to separate oneself from the lures of the, the heart, soul, and the world to make prayer five times a day, to get up from sleep, to postpone lunch, or to eat and not relax, you know, to do, to five times a day, make that separation and turn to God, not to ask for something, okay? Um, not to try to allay uh, an ill or discomfort, but to worship God, it's difficult. Nothing comes that easy. I became, alhamdulillah, a Muslim by the grace of Allah. But I had been doing some work. I'd been seeking. Islam has, at first I thought, might be some sort of punishment because it had certain rules and regulations that I didn't feel um, that I wanted to accept. Uh, I've never been a lover of pork, <laughs> um, so giving up the eating of pig meat didn't affect me whatsoever. Uh, the giving up of the drinking of alcohol didn't upset me at all because I didn't particularly care for the taste of alcohol. I don't understand how anyone actually can say, honestly, state that they like the taste of alcohol. Uh, I find that strange. Uh, there's really not that much about Islam which um, contains a person in terms of getting on with life. Uh, there's the praying and there's the fasting and there's the giving of two and a half percent of one's excess wealth each year, uh, which doesn't come to much when one has a limited income. Well, when I first became Muslim, I, I um, went to live in um, London. <clears throat> there was a, a community there of Muslims, uh, English and, and a few Americans. It, it grew later with more Americans. We were living downtown in London. And um, it was a big, thriving community. We had a shop that uh, sold uh, health foods. And at that time, we wore, uh, be, uh, the, the, the point was that we were Western Muslims who were wearing turbans and robes. And, and so we went all around London in turbans and robes. And it was a, uh, uh, to show the image of Islam uh, among Europeans. Living in England, I attended the, the Juma prayer, the Friday prayer, one day. And for some strange reason, I had a coughing fit. <clears throat> I couldn't stop myself from coughing. 
So I stepped outside of the mosque to get a drink of water and to help myself. When I w stepped outside, there was a young man there who seemed lost. And he was an Englishman who was interested in Islam, but he felt inhibited in entering the mosque itself. He didn't know the proper procedure to make contact with Muslims. As a result um, of my stepping out there, he had someone to speak to. Miraculously, I stopped coughing by it myself, by itself. And I spoke with him for about a half hour, and I, I showed him how to make ablutions, do wudu. And we went into the mosque together, and we prayed t together, and I showed him the rudiments of prayer. And he joined the group, and uh, later on that week, he accepted Islam. Uh, I don't attribute that to me, but it was God perhaps working through me that this particular uh, experience occurred. So now I say, okay, I have the Quran, now I have to meet these people. I have to go where they go. Where do they go? Where do they meet? Well, they meet in a place called a mosque, a masjid. Okay, well, I'm going to go see them at this masjid. I'm going to check them out, as they say. So, to make a long story short, which I never can do, I went to this, to this mosque. I found out where it was, Southern California. I went to the mosque, and I had an upset stomach. It's like when you're wanting, you know you got to do something, but you don't want to do it, you know? You know? And so I wanted to, but I kind of had an uneasiness. Oh, an upset stomach and everything. So I said, well, I'm going to drive around and see if I find a parking space. I drive around. Several times, no parking spaces around the, the masjid. Finally, I said, that's it. I'm going to go one more time. If I don't find a parking space, I'll go home. That was my excuse. As I was making the turn, right in front of the mosque, a car pulled out. <laughs> you are making it very hard for me. So I pull in. Okay, now I am more nervous because I am going to have to face these people. I'm going to have to go. I don't know nothing about Islam. I don't know nothing about Muslim. Okay, I'm just going to go to this place. And our, our, our mosque there in Southern California uh, uh, Center, it gets filled up very big all, all of the time. It gets filled up so you have to go around and in the parking lot they put out some rugs and everything like that. So I'm nervous. I'm going to go for the first time. I walk up to the door. There is this big brother, Arab descent, big beard, standing like this. I walk up, he says, go around. Okay, I go around. I get to the other side, there's the brothers all beginning to bow and do their prayers. They're looking at me, I say, no, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just watching, you know, I'm just looking. Like when you shop, I'm just looking, thank you, I'm just looking. Finally, it was all over. They finished the prayer and everything. They all started to go into the mosque and, and mingle. So I went into the mosque and I started to mingle. And these brothers all kept saying, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum. Salaam Alaikum. I don't know what it means. I don't know what they're saying. But this is the way it happened. Finally, a brother took me. Had, uh, he saw I was kind of a little confused. He grabbed me by the hand and he took me and he says, uh, you're new, right? I said, well, yes, this is my first time. Come on, I'll show you around. Takes me everywhere, takes me to the, to the men's room, shows me the different places. This is where you do voodoo? Voodoo, what's that? It's not voodoo. No, it's voodoo. Okay, it's voodoo. How do you do this? And you wash before you pray and this and that and whatever. Very nice brother. His name is Omar. Allah sent him to me. Okay? Now, the plot thickens because I'm impressed. I like what I see. Now I go home. I'm very happy. Now I decide... I want to pray like them. I, they do prayer. When I was Christian, I just pray. Just kneel my head and I pray. But something appealed to me. When these people get down on their knees and start to bow and prostrate themselves before the Almighty God, the Creator of the universe. Now you see how the religion works. You see how our religion is so much simpler, how it's so beautiful, how it appeals to the intellect and mind. I do not feel embarrassed. It appealed to me. This made sense to me. This is the God, the creator of the universe. Shouldn't I bow down to him? Am I so arrogant? A little piece of clay? What, uh, what Islam demands of me is very little. Praying now has become like brushing my teeth. It's just something I do naturally and normally. Uh, fasting is uh, something that I look forward to each year because 
uh, other than the physical um, enjoyment that I get from fasting in terms of feeling better, feeling lighter, losing weight around my midsection, getting to that age, you know. Um, spiritually, I felt good each evening uh, that I've really accomplished something. And taken into account when you are involved with a community of other Muslims and you are all doing it together, it's a wonderful shared experience and one does feel blessed. Islam is based on the upward path. Everything else is going down. Islam turns that into the positive. Once a man said, he told me the symbol of the Muslim and the non-Muslim. The non-Muslims, they wear their fur coats with the fur, you know, outside. But the Muslim, he has the fur inside. So we don't show necessarily the beauty. Sometimes it is difficult to see the contentment which is in Islam. But you become a Muslim and then you will realize what is that contentment. Uh, I cannot really think of uh, limitations uh, placed on me because I'm a Muslim. And you know, it all comes down to several things in the Quran and the Hadith. One of my favorite as I was looking through the surahs, and I hope you'll pardon me if I don't do my Arabic very well. It says, It hajja an nasrullahi wal fatr wa ra'aythan nasa yaqtuluna fi dhin al-akhi afwaja fasubi bi khamdi rabbik wa istafa ana inaw kana tawaba When you see the people come into God's religion in great crowds, rejoice, give praise to God. I, I, I was a, in Berkeley, I was living in Berkeley, I had a, a book of poems published and I was writing a lot of poetry and I also had a theater company that, that did, it was during the Vietnam War, we were doing a ritual theater that was basically kind of Tibetan Buddhist in, in, in uh, texture where we painted our faces and, and uh, waved our hands and had an orchestra of gongs and horns and bells and things like that. And I wrote the text and had this theater company of artists and people of like mind and we were presenting things for free out at, at, at night and, and, and had quite a nice following. Well, that, that collapsed and I was sort of biding my time for uh, about six months uh, writing out my poetry trans uh, manuscripts and typing them up. And I got a telephone call from a man who had seen a write-up about our theater uh, in, a, in a Rolling Stone magazine. And uh, he was a Muslim, an Englishman, and he came from um, Morocco where he'd heard about us and came and visited us. He had a job in Hollywood for a short while that actually fell through. And he uh, wanted to meet me, so we met in, in Berkeley and um, he was an extraordinary gentleman and told uh, all about Islam and about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, the beauty of Islam. And I, um, I became a Muslim as a result of that uh, with a few other people as well, two or three other people as well. Now, it's interesting because I, I wrote about that in, in a magazine, uh, this Whole Earth Review magazine, and it was uh, just a page called Choosing Islam, uh, One Man's Tale, that actually I found has been reprinted a lot and, and, and has a kind of um, fame all its own because it's the story of a, an American man who, me in this case, who's confronted with Islam and, and is made, uh, asked to make a choice. And at that moment, I chose Islam. Before anything, there is Allah, who brought into existence the heavens and the earth with a word. He created the angels from light. He created the jinn from fire. And he created the humans from clay. Allah gave knowledge to Adam, the first human, and commanded his earlier creations to bow to man's honored position. The angels obeyed. Iblis, the jinn, did not. So Allah banished Iblis and those who followed him from his presence. Before leaving, Iblis asked his Lord for time to prove man unworthy. Allah gave him till the day of judgment. Iblis promised to do anything and everything to misguide the humans. He boasted that they would follow him. 
a law promised to fill hell with Iblis men and jinn who do, and they were called the evil ones. Meanwhile, Adam and his mate were given instructions by Allah, and they thrived for a time, but the evil ones schemed persistently to get them to disobey their Lord. When the evil ones succeeded, Allah inspired Adam and his wife with words of remorse and repentance. He forgave them and assigned them to live on earth. Allah taught them the behavior that pleased him and called it Islam. He promised paradise for all who live it. As the family of Adam grew, only a few kept the knowledge of Islam. Many among them succumbed to the seduction of the evil ones and mischief spread throughout the earth. Periodically, Allah raised from the people prophets. The prophets were divinely guided men whose job it was to teach the people Islam. Some of the prophets were given books, but the people changed the words to fit their own desires. So Allah sent his final prophet with a book he promised to protect, a revelation called the Quran, clear choice for men and jinn. Love.